Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science. And a lot has changed since COVID-19 physical distancing restrictions began, including the way we access healthcare. An increasing number of Australians are choosing to consult their doctors online or on the phone, rather than visiting the clinic itself. So is that a glimpse into the future? My guest today is Professor Michael Kidd, who is Principal Medical Advisor to the Department of Health and Professor of Primary Care Reform at the Australian National University. He's also been the architect of the telehealth revolution. Michael, welcome. Thanks, Paul. It's good to be on. Firstly, what is telehealth? Mm -hmm. So telehealth is allowing us to use uh, telecommunications technology to communicate uh, with our patients and uh, and in the context of the reforms which have been taking place over the last few weeks in Australia in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this includes both telephone and video uh, consultations between healthcare providers and their patients. So just briefly, how does that work in practice? So I can actually contact my GP, say, by phone and say, I'd like to talk to my doctor. And then at the appointed time, uh, you have a consultation over the phone or, or a video conference. Yep. So that's one, one of the ways. Uh, we've introduced a number of ways for people to be communicating. Uh, one is for the patient to reach out uh, and either to speak to someone directly or to make an appointment uh, for an allotted time. But also uh, providers are also able to reach out to their their patients, which we think is particularly important. At the moment, uh, many people are still in isolation across the country. Uh, we're very concerned that many of our patients are not coming uh, to see their providers face to face. So we're proactively encouraging our healthcare workers to reach out to their regular patients to make sure that they're doing okay, to follow up on what is happening with their uh, chronic disease management, with their mental health conditions, with their other conditions, and if necessary, to make arrangements for face-to-face -face consultations. How widespread is it being used now? Do you have any sort of early numbers on, on uh, how many doctors are now using telehealth and, and even patients? Yes, so this uh, move towards telehealth started uh, in the middle of March, and then we've had five stages where we've had uh, increasing numbers of patients and healthcare providers being able to uh, utilise the uh, the consultation items under Medicare, uh, and their patients, of course, receive rebates for those uh, consultations. Uh, we've now reached about 5 million consultations have occurred in the last uh, five to six weeks, uh, and um, that's right across the country. Uh, many of those have been with general practitioners, but we've also expanded the uh, ability for other consultant specialists, medical specialists, to uh, use telehealth with their patients, uh, many allied health uh, and nursing professionals who are looking after patients under chronic disease management plans or under mental health uh, plans are able to reach out to their patients and a number of items for uh, for other uh, providers uh, providing the care that they would normally be providing face-to-face, -face, now also being able to provide that through telehealth. We've also allowed uh, people who are healthcare workers and are themselves vulnerable and at increased risk uh, if they were to contract COVID-19 uh, to be able to do telehealth as well. So it's been probably one of the most dramatic changes we've seen to Medicare uh, since it was introduced, this move to whole of person uh, telehealth right across the country in a very rapid rollout, uh, of course, in direct response to the risks which uh, have arisen as a result of the pandemic. Some people might be worried that doctors can't do the same kind of job as they can in person. What are the limitations? Well, there are limitations. Uh, APRA, the, uh, the regulator for the health professions in Australia, put out some guidance uh, this week about uh, the safe and appropriate use of telehealth and when it's not appropriate to use telehealth. Similarly, many of the uh, professional colleges have been putting out uh, guidance to their members about the specifics of the type of practices which people have and when telehealth is appropriate and, and is not. One of the things that we're very concerned about, and this comes from the experience of past pandemics and past epidemics of infectious diseases is that sometimes people 
don't get access to the regular health care that they need. And so you may get uh, people not getting attention for acute uh, health care problems, for the management of chronic disease, for the management of mental health concerns, for the preventive interventions which would normally be in place. And as a consequence, you may actually see more morbidity and mortality arising from other conditions than actually arise from the infectious agent itself. And we've been very concerned because with the social restrictions with many vulnerable people staying in their homes, uh, people haven't been reaching out to get their regular health care. We've actually seen a reduction in hospitalizations for people with heart attacks and strokes uh, over the uh, last four to six weeks. And what this probably means is that people are, are having events but are staying at home, which of course puts uh, people at, at markedly increased risk. Um, given that we have managed to flatten the curve in Australia and we don't have our hospitals being overwhelmed uh, with uh, cases of people seriously unwell with COVID-19, this is probably the safest time it's ever been uh, for Australians to actually be going uh, to hospitals, to be going to their general practices, uh, to be reaching out and getting their health care. But many people are very worried about leaving their homes. Uh, the health Minister Greg Hunt put out a statement last week encouraging everybody not to neglect their general health care. And I think that if your people who are listening can encourage uh, both themselves but also their family members, uh, the contacts they have, please make sure that people are continuing to get the health care that they need for everything, not just for COVID-19. Yeah, it's a really important message. Mental health is a particular challenge in this crisis. How does that kind of care look different in this environment and also with telehealth? Well, one of the initiatives which has been put forward by the government has been establishing a national COVID-19 health and research advisory committee, providing advice to the chief medical officer, Brendan Murphy. And one of the first uh, tasks of that committee has been to look at the impact of mental health uh, and the impact of being in quarantine or being in isolation. And we have had lots of reports about people who are having a huge amount of difficulty in coping with the isolation, uh, in coping uh, with those who've been put in the enforced uh, quarantine, either those arriving in the country from overseas or those who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 or have been uh, cases, uh, suspected uh, contacts of people with COVID-19 while they wait uh, for test results uh, to come through. So this is creating a huge um, potential future burden of mental health concerns uh, right across the country. And it may well be that we see subsequent waves um, not of COVID-19, but of mental health uh, concerns and of chronic disease uh, concerns arising out of uh, the impacts of the pandemic. Uh, fortunately, uh, the Australian government, the states and territories, uh, many of the peak organisations in mental health have increased the uh, resources which are available to people. Again, many of these resources being available uh, through telehealth, uh, through online uh, access uh, through the Lifeline and the Beyond Blue lines and the other lines which are available for people to utilise. But we also, I think, everyone in society needs to be playing a part here. Uh, many of us are fortunate enough to be uh, in isolation with our nuclear family, uh, providing we're in a functional family that's that can be very supportive. But of course, we know that some people are in isolation where there's domestic violence occurring and, uh, and where people are actually at risk. Uh, many other people are in isolation uh, and may be the only person uh, in their home. Uh, it's been very heartening to see many Australians reaching out uh, to their neighbours who they know live on their own to make sure they're okay through having those uh, chats over the uh, over the fence uh, for vulnerable elderly neighbours, doing the shopping for them. Uh, there's been this real sense of community, which we probably haven't seen in Australia, maybe even since uh, war times, with uh, with people just being so conscious and and looking after each other. And this will help to to placate and perhaps reduce some of the uh, some of the isolation. But we also have people who are sometimes forgotten in our community, the new arrivals who may not speak uh, English, the uh, backpackers who are here and stuck in Australia and living in hostels, the international students who 
are not going to classes at university and are isolated on their own. Um, our Aboriginal uh, communities, especially in remote locations, which have been locked down. So there are many different groups of people who you know, I'm very concerned about and, and I know our organisations are doing the best they can to reach out, but we probably need to be doing even more for some of these um, groups which may be forgotten uh, as part of the, the general waves of support that we're providing. Yeah, it's that, that, that message of staying physically distant but not socially isolated and staying in contact where we possibly can. Australia's done really well at flattening the curve of new cases for COVID-19. We, don't want to, we do want to avoid a second wave as we return to somewhat normal life um, or, or work out what normal life is now. How does telehealth help with that? Well, telehealth will, will continue. So the, the uh, initiatives under the Medicare benefits schedule are in place for at least six months and then they'll be reviewed. Obviously, what happens next depends on what, what is happening both within Australia with COVID-19, but also with the rollout of the pandemic uh, right around the world. And, uh, and so... Uh, we, we're still to see uh, what happens, but the uh, the telehealth, I think, is going to be really important, uh, even as some of the restrictions are lifted. We still have a lot of vulnerable people. Um, we still have people who are frail and elderly in their own homes, people with disability in their own homes who are not able to get out and come to clinics and attend appointments, uh, who normally would be relying on uh, home-based uh, care uh, and adding in the telehealth, I hope is actually going to enhance the care that we can deliver to those people and maybe provide even better care than we were able to provide beforehand. And the same applies to people who are in residential aged care facilities right across the country um, where telehealth has been picked up as well. And we've actually seen increased uh, linkage uh, with people's uh, chosen GPs uh, and uh, uh, and, and more care being provided uh, than we've seen before. So I think we're looking at evolving new models of healthcare uh, delivery, particularly to make sure we're looking after the most vulnerable people in our society. And this is a really good thing. All right, Michael Kidd, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Paul. Great to take part. Thank you. And a reminder, if you're looking for specific COVID-19 content, just head to science.org.au slash COVID-19. Enjoy your weekend at home and I'll see you soon.